It's that time again. It's the Berkey and the Badger board game babble show. It's going to get wild. It's going to get wacky. It might even get a little zany. We're going to talk about board games in the board game industry. And, you know, we might talk about anything else we want to talk about. Hey, hey, hey! We are live! Berkey and Badger, episode 71, G Gamer Rules. And I am... <laughs> Is that why Paul Grogan's in the, in the castle? Oh, something like that. <laughs> gaming, uh, gaming goals, your sire. Gaming goals, gaming, gaming goals, gaming yes. Gaming goals. Hello, yes. hello, Babylites, and welcome to the Berkeys and Badgers board game Babel show. In the wonderful kingdom of Babylot, I am your rightful, honorable king ruler, King Berkey. And I am the host of this elegant podcast, which is streamed live via YouTube, direct from Steam Yard. Oh, yeah, baby. Steam Yard from Babylot. Steam yard, something yeah, like lucky. that. Yeah, it's lucky it's not the yard of steam, which I've seen right behind the horse stables. Oh it's, yes, it's a lot a yard of and, steam coming and, up from yeah. piles of stuff. Yes, piles. <laughs> piles <laughs> may be part of the problem. <laughs> this this show is a pile of it, <laughs> <laughs> and oh, does it stink so beautifully? Oh, what a whiff. Not well, me. I'm your humble king, and right down to the lowest roaming tourist. Um, speaking of the lowest of the low, I would like to welcome to the show our court jester, Sir Badger. Oh, what an entrance that is. Thank you very much, sire. Oh, oh. Uh, <laughs> let me introduce you to some of the people in your king's court today. We have, as always, Kabuki Kid wearing the uh, latest uh, armor. Uh, we have yes. Dan Hughes with his magnificent beard. Uh, which oh, is he has a wonderful some... beard. Yes, and uh, Paul Grogan was in a second ago with his gaming rules, and I think he's just popped out for a cuppa. Oh, he popped out. He popped, he popped out, out. Popped in, popped out, pooped out. Maybe he just yeah. pooped out. He maybe he pooped out, and he's yes. going to do a yard steam. Uh, he heard about the steaming pile of poo and said, I've had enough. <laughs> yes, Dan. Your 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 beard is truly resplendent. Resplendent. Oh, he's using big words to show us how smart and how improved he is. Yes, yes. yes so anyway, improved. Welcome everyone to Babylon and welcome to episode 71. Uh and in this show, we're going to be talking about what's been going on in Babylon very quickly and then we're going to do a roundup of rumors uh which are going around uh in our new section things <laughs> that make the king go hmm because mm. nothing makes me go hmm apart from burger king mm. well, uh, we, i'll just i'll just chime in on that real quick we just decided uh that we were going to tighten up that thing that goes things that make us go whom segment so that I'll come up with a news item that we both want to talk about. And we thought mm -hmm. that might make just the front end of the show just a little bit tighter as we have lots of wonderful things to talk about. Okay. And that's why the script is blank. The script blank. is blank. So I don't know what he's going to talk about. So this subject is going to throw me, but <laughs> I like anyway. that. I like that actually. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to be caught with my trousers down like someone else was on our last show. Um, oh. <laughs> uh, uh, we're going to go after that into our first impression section, which is the good, the not so bad, and the ugly. The ugly. And we, we, we've drifted. I've just seen the memes that Berkey's done, and we're drifting back in to Star Trek. <laughs> um, then we're going to have a little wander around the woods of Evergreen and talk about those games which have survived the test of time, which we believe survived the test of time. And this time we're going to be looking at games from 2010. And then we're going to move on to our babble subject about goals. What goals have you set as a gamer? Do you have any goals? Um, and I'll tell you a funny story about that. <laughs> 
<laughs> and how I tried to get responses from everyone on Facebook. Um, that was in awesome. That section. Yes. So, shall we? Well, just talk what's going on in Babylon? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, Babylon for me has been all about uh, game toppers, as as usual. You guys uh, get to hear a lot about that because that's top of mind right now. Our Kickstarter went incredibly well. I mean, we are so blown away by how awesome the game topper backers are. Our Generation 1 backers, man, they came in full force to jump into our 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 next campaign, you know, that we finished uh, uh, actually right before Gen Con. But what was so wonderful about it is we have so many new backers and then we launched the late pledge manager. So you could jump in and get all of the 40 unlock stretch goals, plus all of the fantastic Kickstarter prices, all the new gaming mats that we're offering, all the new storage solutions, the new styles of game toppers. People could late pledge. Well, uh, that's been going on now for about three weeks before we've locked down the orders. And actually, we locked down the orders last night, but it's going to take us about two to three days to compile everything, double check all the international shipping. And so honestly, people can still jump in and late pledge. We're not going to change any prices till we finish that information. Uh, so if you haven't had an opportunity to jump in as a late backer, you can still do it. Well, that has been consuming a ton of our time, but do you realize we've almost doubled our Kickstarter in late pledges? Ooh, wow. It's doubled. It's remarkable. Mm. Um, it, it's typically you can expect to see a 15 to 20% bump on late pledges. Uh, but we have been just so favored by everyone to enjoy just just an incredible surge, which uh, we are so enthusiastic. And but it's take we've kind of moved a little bit from marketing mindset into more of a a production mindset. So we're getting ready to do all of that. But I've been working so hard with game toppers. That's what's been going on in Babylon, of course. But I've decided that I was going to take a little holiday, as you would say. Oh, nice. Yeah. Wait, my, wait. Well, my father is uh, coming up and his wife from North Dakota with their camper. And uh, we're, they're going to be here today at about four o'clock. And we're actually going to go up to a Tasca State Park, which is this. It's actually where the headwaters, where the beginning of the Mississippi River is. And we're going to camp for three days. So I am I'm just super, super jazzed, actually, about being able to just take a few days to spend with family, enjoy them. Uh, but today is like a crazy busy work day. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I can imagine after the weekend and all that. Yeah, but we're super pumped. You know, Game Toppers is just doing great. People love what's happening and the the new offerings that we are in are, are have brought to public. Are, people are just amazed at them. They love the new scythe inspired mat. Mm -hmm. uh, the resource mat, the Viking mat, the Ryan Lockett mat is gorgeous. Uh, and now the new fantasy mat. We just posted all the new artwork, uh, the latest rendition of it on Game Topper Nation Facebook group. And you can see this incredible art. Uh, it's just off the hook stuff. And and I have some things planned that is going to take it a whole nother notch as soon as we get through this 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 time timeline. So super excited. Bam! Up another notch. <laughs> another notch. Bam! Another notch. <laughs> so, what's going on in your neck of Babylon? Well, down in the south of Babylon, we we we've, we've had a little holiday. We had a two day holiday Ooh. in Belgium, cool. uh, which happened to correspond with uh, the Belgium Games Festival. So, we were there for a day, wandering around, um, and as you can see, it's an open air event with tents and stuff. And there's some games that I took pictures of. And it's very, very kind of uh, amazing, a, a gorgeous place to, to visit. As you can see, like the architecture Ooh. is astounding. Now, that's all the pictures that I did took because I was just walking around, bumping into people that I knew and having chats with them while my, my daughter and my wife were getting a bit kind of um, um, restless. 
And so we we didn't we didn't play many games. We played a few games, but um, that was it basically. And everything else is hunky dory as normal. Um, I'm still doing stuff, music, music, music. Yes, and boardgameseverybodyshould.com. Um, and um, talking of music, the rock god himself, Mr. Lance Meister, is in the castle. Ah! I do a very low bow for you, the, the bravest knight of all knights, the uh, undead he, Viking. He, he, uh, his ears must have been riching, uh, itching while I was writing down issues, so don't spoil anything there. <laughs> No problem. Oh, right. I think with that, it might be uh, good for us real quickly. Let's just talk about the, the poll from our last show. Oh, yes. And then, and then we'll go into our segment, uh, Things That Makes the King Go Hmm. You caught me with my pants down. Yes, I put up a poll. I hate on... that. I hate that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we put up a poll on the uh, Board Game Geek Guild 2248, which is our guild. Um, woo, there it is, unboxed, and it actually has a link to the last show. And um, on our last show, we were talking about the importance of unboxing. Do you feel it's? Do you feel the need to unbox right away or to savor it? What games uh, have you not unboxed, and uh, what games do you still sit on yourself? Sit on yourself, Sam. I can't say it. I can't say it at all. Shut the same. Anywho, um, so the first poll was, do you unbox games almost immediately after getting them, or do you let them sit and shrink until you play them? Or do they never come out? And a vast majority of people, as you can see, 83.9%, said that, yes, they punch it out and sniff it and read it instantly as soon as the front door is shut. Mm. Where only 14% said no, and five people, so that's 1.8%, say that they are collectors and they leave all their games mint. Wow. That's that's a lot of people. Yeah, I I I think it's you know, for me it's it's I'm not getting to play as many games as I'd like to play. So I tend to not take the shrink wrap off until I'm ready to play it or ready to learn the rules and watch a video, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. because I don't want my components. The shrink wrap helps keep any moisture from getting into it and things like that. So that's why I don't. Um, but then oftentimes I'll get a Kickstarter, it's in shrink, and I was all excited when I backed the Kickstarter. And then after a year has passed, I'm not so excited anymore. And I've got other things on my mind. And, and like, am I going to resell it maybe or cull it? Or am I actually going to play it? And um, that's been my constant struggle the last two years, just because not been able to play as many games as I like to play. So that's why I don't punch them immediately. But if I'm super crazy excited about playing it and it just comes in, I'm going to unpunch it right away and organize it. Mm, yeah. As I said in the last show, I unpunch it immediately, smell it, read the rules, and then forget the rules by the time someone really wants to play it with me. So it's like, <laughs> start again. <laughs> yeah, next question. Yep. Um, how long on, on average does it take you to for a new game to hit the table and get played? Uh, the largest portion, say around about a month. So 43% of our 288 voters said, yeah, it takes about a month. See, I would have I would have said three months, but we didn't have an option for three months. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I could have put three months, four months, five months, six months, seven months, eight months, nine months, ten months, eleven months. I've thirteen got months. months. Thirteen yeah. months. Yeah, yeah. And All kinds days of later. months. You could have yeah. done many months. Yeah, I should have done 28 days later, 28 eight months later, 28 <laughs> years later. Um, yeah, so, um, which is a vast amount, which is good, which doesn't fall into my category of about a year. <laughs> maybe longer it's kind of like as i said a mean average there's there's games that i can get to play within a week but a majority of the games take about six to 12 months to be played and there's some games which are like two two years three years um and a lot of people did put longer as well so we had uh 4.9 percent said longer but uh yeah the second largest was actually a week so that's pretty good a majority yeah. of people actually do get to their games pretty quick so then they're, they're not like lance who are has them stuck in his shop. <laughs> Paul Grogan says, from one week to two years. 
<laughs> I understand that that I have some games that I bought two years ago at Gen Con that are still sitting on my shelf of shame. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's most of his Gen Con stuff is in his garage waiting for a spot in his studio. Yeah. That's just the the troubles we oh the troubles I know. Oh the troubles. Yes. These third world problems. And the last oh, question was know. uh if you have a shelf of shame, how many games are currently sitting on it? Uh, and this is this is very surprising. Um, and the fast, the largest majority is about up to ten. Thirty-three percent of our voters said they have about ten games, whereas twenty-eight percent said they have one or two, which is pretty good. And then all the rest, from twenty to thirty and forty, they drop off gradually. Um, so that's a good sign. Mine is disgusting. I currently have 43 games that are sitting there. Yes, I know. I've seen them. There they are. Yeah. <laughs> there that, they are. That, that's actually an old picture, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I so think these polls, by the way, are just fantastic, Barry. You do such a great job with these polls. And uh, I think people really enjoy it. It seems like we're getting a lot of interaction on the BGG Guild 2248. So we'll be able to continue to really, uh, really keep doing that. I think it's a lot of fun. Yeah, the BGG, the BGG is the best place to go about board gaming. And it's looking prettier and prettier as time goes on, which is great. Well, it's we're going to move watching. right Scott on watching. to our next segment then. The new segment, Things That Makes the King Go, hmm. Okay. We need graphics. We need a graphic for that, sir. Yes, you have to make up a graphic. Board Game News. Berkey and Badger reflect on the current events that are happening in the board game industry. Hey, a graphic. Some may be good, oh, some there may it be is. bad. Hmm. But there are all things that make us go, hmm, hmm, hmm. hmm. When we upgrade, which I might do next week. Yeah, we'll do that next week. I'll do um, I'll do some little videos. That That's become happen. a new phrase. We'll do that next week. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's time to, for me to have my pants around my ankle again. What, Sire, is making you go? Well, mm. I have two things that make me go, hmm. Uh, the first one, it's interesting that Sir... Uh, Sir Lancelot of Undead Viking video fame is in the kingdom uh, listening to our wonderful presentation, of course. Uh, but Lance Meister, the Undead Viking, has made a huge announcement. Uh, he worked for Tasty Minstrel Games for many years and was really one of the, I believe, one of the driving forces to help that company with a lot of their presentation of their products, particularly in relation to Kickstarter and media. And so he's had such great uh, influence within the hobby. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. Uh, but recently, Tasty Minstrel has made some changes and, uh, and Lance was actually uh, let go from the company. Uh, there wasn't any problem or anything like that. So there's no controversy here at all. Uh, just companies restructure and, you know, their their outfit is in Utah and different things of that nature. So no problem with that. No, no need to speculate about any of it. But Lance is, uh, has been picked up as a free agent by Fun Again Games Logistics. Fun Again Logistics. Yeah, there you've got it right there. Now, the thing that made me go, hmm, about the whole thing is Fun Again used to be a online retailer of games. And I think they still have a little bit of that going on where they bring some titles from overseas. But one of their big focuses has been around picking up games from Kickstarters and help bring that into the distribution channel. And when I heard that Lance got picked up by them, I was just like, uh, I was really impressed. And uh, he says he's easier to be picked up now that he's lost these you know, he's lost like 350 pounds doing keto diet, you know, so he's lost half of his body weight. Now he lost 350 pounds so that if he's lost half of it, he's he's like about that weight now, I think, if I remember how the calculations work. But 
because he's so easy to pick up, fun again now, uh, has an am amazing Kickstarter expert and board game influencer on their their company roles. Pretty amazing. Mm. Yeah, I'm happy for him because I heard that he he lost his job and then within a week he would got a new one, which is great. Um, there's nothing worse than, you know, not having a job. Ah, yeah, I know that feeling, but uh, now I've got too many jobs, much like well, yourself. <laughs> I was I, I was very happy for him, too. I was concerned right away when I heard about it. And so, uh, you know, I reached out to him right away because I was thinking about him concerned. And and, you know, you want to you want to be there for people when they're those are those are really difficult situations when you don't know about the future. And um, yeah. I knew that his quality would shine through. And I knew that some opportunities would happen. So super thrilled about that. Congratulations, Fun Again Logistics, and congratulations, Lance. Yeah. Cool. Uh, the other thing that's making me go, hmm, which is a little bit more uh, uh, gaming uh, as a game news, news item, is IDW has picked up and made a publishing agreement with a comic book based on Eric Lang's Rising Sun. Well, this, uh, this just really blows my mind. Um, I looked at it, and I love Eric Lang's designs. I really do. Blood Rage, as many of you know, is my favorite game. Um, I got the full-blown Kickstarter version of Rising Sun, and, and I played it three times. Honestly, I didn't care for Rising Sun near as much. There's just some things about movement and different things that I didn't enjoy quite as much. And I, but I think this game is so, it's amazing. It's, it's just gorgeous. I, I don't think it's a bad design. There's just a few things of it that I don't care for as much. So it, it didn't, I was so excited to get it. That's one I opened right away. And then afterwards I was like, well, nah. But I love the universe. I love the theme. I love the look of the game. It's just so crazy. And then when I saw this, I thought, wow, this will be cool. It's it's an initial three book miniseries, and the following issues will be provided exclusive content that promise, promises to enhance the gaming player experience for many of the game fans. So all of a sudden, this backstory, if you will, or this continuing story is going to be incorporated to the game. And all of a sudden, I went, well, maybe I kind of want to get these comic books, and maybe I want to play it again just from the thematic side, because I love thematics. Um, one thing that made me go, hmm, was that the artist who did Rising Sun is not the artist that's doing the comics. Now, I thought this was kind of interesting. I think logistically that totally makes sense, but it also takes it a little bit out. It's a different style. So that made me go, whom? The new artist is Martin Coca-Colo? Coca-Colo? C-O-C-C-O-L-O. And he previously illustrated webcomic complications as well as Star Trek Year 5 that were published by IDW. So what do you think about that? Um, yeah, a film would be better. What do you say? <laughs> a movie, a movie, baby. Can you um, see, do you see a picture of it there? It's got a picture of a dragon and a, yeah, a, yeah, yeah. a an, an archer and she's getting ready to aim at something. Yeah, I don't know how I feel. I mean, it's it's nice uh, to see that board game is branching out, not just into board games or crossovers with other board game companies. And it's it's just nice to see them go into film or go into uh, another medium of some sort. Um, so, yeah, I haven't played Rising Sun. I had no hype or expectations for Rising Sun. So I, I'm not on the Rising Sun bandwagon. Um, if it was Catan, yeah, I'd be all over it, maybe. A Catan comic. Oh, yeah. Bring it in. Bring it in. Well, I actually like the new artwork. I think it's really nice. It's got kind of a watercolor flair to it. Um, but not having Adrian Smith doing the art, it just, I don't know. There, there was a little bit of a tilt for me. But, you know, when, when Star Wars Rebels came out and 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 the different Disney uh, breakoffs of that Star Wars and they had different art styles, I had a little hard time 
transitioning from from them. But I love the cartoons. I love the shows. But but because the art was different, it it it, it was a little bit of a disconnect. And I kind of feel that, but I really like it. So I, th I think the story is a bit more important than the art. If there's a good story behind it, then you don't really think about the eyes. I mean, it's like it's like us in Star Trek. The Star Trek stories are really good. We don't worry about the, the set wobbling and <laughs> everything looking like it's made out of plastic. <laughs> well, K Kabuki Kids said uh, it's, it's interesting that uh, Adrian Smith, a comic book artist, isn't Adrian Smith, a comic book artist first. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that, but that would be really amazing. Then you'd think he'd want to be a part of that comic book, and IDW would have perhaps secured his services through uh, Come On. I don't know, uh, but it's... Cool Mini. It, yeah. Cool yeah, mini. what do you call them? Cool Mini. I like Cool Mini better, too. That's a whole other topic. You said Come On. Well, that's what they're supposed to. They want to be going... They don't want to be called Simon anymore. They want to call Come On. And come I'm like, on then. I just like, I like cool mini. Cool mini or not didn't even make sense to me. Why would you say or not? Because cool mini got, because they have games that aren't minis, so or not. But just cool mini. I don't know. Talk to the hand. It's not my decision. Come on then, let's move on, shall we? To yeah, let's move on to the good, the not so bad, and the ugly. No, no, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the good. The not so bad. Wait for it. And the ugly. There it is. Uh, in your best Scotty voice, you must go through the memes, sir. Okay. I'm we don't hire you as the court gesture for nothing. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so the good meme is just your collection of shelf of shame. <sighs> so I can see where this, this show is going to go. <laughs> the not so bad is a very young James Dunahan. Um in the engine room he's not in a jeffrey's tube he's in an engine room um all right let's try this it's been a while come on okay <clears throat> <laughs> like i said captain i know there are rule books that need to be read but you can't take it <laughs> you can't take it i don't know <laughs> <laughs> ah, the Dice Odyssey has joined us. Kaz is in the house, in the castle. Absolutely. And the ugly, sir. The ugly. It's a very young Sean Bean. Sean John. <laughs> uh yeah, that the other the other Scotty. Um oh, Scotty. Um, uh, Scotty. Um I try and do a, a Londoner trying to sound like a Scottish guy. It's a lot easier to do an American trying to sound like a Scottish guy than it is a Londoner. Um hey how am I going to keep my reputation as a miracle worker if if you keep buying hundreds of games a year that you you can't possibly play? No, oh, that was that, that was actually a mix. You're you're fired. Between, that was a mix between Kirk. And... You're fired. You're fired. <laughs> no, you're fired. No, <laughs> you're fired. No, you're fired. <laughs> you're fired. I'm fired. Oh dear. Oh so, man. Yes. That's a botch. All right, so we've been playing some games. These are our first impressions of these games. We're going to explain the game, let everybody guess what game it is, and then uh, we're going to rate them good, not so bad, or ugly. So what have you I, been playing? Give us I the first one. I can't do a Sarah Connor accent. <laughs> Sorry, Kabuki. Sarah uh -huh. Connor. Okay, yeah. <laughs> So I'm not going to try and be vague. I'm just going to be precise, and I'm just not going to mention the title of the game to make it easy. Okay, this first game, he said, putting his liquid uh, nourishment down, yes, is yeah. um, a dexterity game where you're trying to get 100 points. And you're doing this by flicking discs on a wooden table, which happens to be circular. With a hole in the middle of this circular. Table. I know, I know what it is. Pick me, pick me. 
Yes, you beat Kabuki, so I'm going to pick you, sir. It's Croconol. It is indeed. Yes. I've never played Croconol before. And um, in the hotel that we were staying in in Belgium, um, it's called Funky, spelt F-U-N-K-E-Y, um, wow. which has uh, is ba- it's a hotel based on board gaming. Um, each of the rooms has their own little theme. So we were staying in the Dixit room and there were some big canvas uh, images of Dixit cards. There was also a Dixit, a Dixit board game taken apart and stuck on a big kind of tableau, which was on the wall. Uh, and then there were other rooms. There was a chess room and then there was a Catan room and there was lots of other things. But they had a crokinole table downstairs along with a selection of board games. And uh, me and my daughter late at night were just, do you want to play this? So we played some Monotama. We played some uh, Flamme Rouge. Um, and my wife went to bed and so me and my daughter just played some crokinole. Um And it was... What do you think I think it was? Uh, I think you think it was good. Yeah, yeah. I've got no complaints about it. It's uh, It was fun 15 minutes flicking tokens and and uh, getting them in the hole, which was I was shocked myself. I was quite surprised how easy it was to get them in the hole. Um, but, yeah, it was just a fun dexterity game, very light. Um, we played our own version. We're just getting as many points as possible. Um, and then the next day we came downstairs and before breakfast and had a few more games. It was fun. Um, I love Crokinole. We we bought a a, a fairly uh, reasonably priced but decent quality uh, Crokinole board from Mayday Games, and uh, we just love it. And uh, I have that hanging in in my game room. It looks like a great big Viking shield because it's hanging on the wall. Mm-hmm. But we, we love playing it um, all kinds of different ways. Like Kabuki Kid there, I see, says that, uh, did you play it 2v2? And we love playing it in teams where you have two people against two people or playing three-player or playing two-player. Um, it's just always a blast. It just seems like people love that dexterity. Can I do it? The challenge of of, of, of that flicking and that type of thing. And uh, like you say, it's really quick. So mm. it's a great gateway solution to bring somebody in to just get them in the mood to have some fun playing games, right? Yeah, yeah. Dice Odyssey asks, what's our favorite dexterity game? I'm not a dexterity game player, uh, but the three which I enjoy are Mulky, um, Wobbly, which is like a Tower of Marbles. Um, yeah, Tower of Marbles. Um, and uh, Catch the Moon. Huh. I would actually say uh, Crokinole would be, be my favorite. Um, I liked Flick em Up. It was fine. Um, I didn't actually keep it because we just don't get it to the table very much, but I have played a couple games of Pitch Car, which I really did enjoy that, but I don't own it. <laughs> okay, so. so that was one game that I played. Brand new. Well, all right. I've been playing a game. Uh, This is uh, from a European publisher, and the game has a name of a city in Europe. And in this game, you are trying to build a building, and you can have tiles that allow you to complete um, with windows or non-windows. There are some different tiles that allow you to collect more cards, which are very Ticket to Ride-esque in that you're doing set collection. I got it. You got it? Yeah, I got it. So what do you think? Do do we have anybody in the the chat chat that has an idea? No, they're all talking about dexterity games. Uh, I I have one called Push. Push. Yeah. Yeah, I'm always pushing. Yeah, that's not my game. Uh, uh, (laughs) I'm going to go with Copenhagen due to the fact that one of my colleagues has just reviewed it. Boom. So (laughs) Copenhagen is what it is. And I was able to get the deluxe version actually from Ryan Bruns and Travis Reynolds, our good friends at Queen Games. And I've known them for years. Uh, They actually gave the game to me as a review copy. 
Um, I've actually had the opportunity to play this game four times, which is 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 uh, interesting. Um, it, it's a family weight game. Uh, so we've been able to bring it out with family members. Uh, my wife has played it a couple times. Last night we played it with our niece, uh, Katie, and she's uh, 11 years old, I believe. And uh, she was able to pick up the game, you know, rather quickly. And so what do you think I think about this game? Well, it's, t it's very like Ticket to Ride-ish where you're building up mosaics on a Tetris style in a, on a building um, and you're trying to get lines to get points. Um, so I think that it kind of is your ballpark, um, even though it's like not near your house at all. But um, yeah, I think you like it. I think you think it's good. Yeah, I actually do think it's good. I'm, I'm, I, I slightly hesitated because I was a little concerned maybe about replayability. I've played it four mm -hmm. times. It, it has a different feel every time depending on the player counts. And I've had an opportunity to play it at a couple different player counts, four and three. <coughs> Excuse me. But I think uh, it, it, it's such a nice gateway game. You know, the cover art and everything, it's just that typical, eh, I don't get excited about it. Um, mm -hmm. But I really love the deluxe version with the clear transparent tiles with the windows. And I, I think it's clever the way you can manipulate these tire, tiles, like you say, Tetris wise, and there's a limited amount of them and everybody is trying to get the two and the three and the four, and they're all different orientations. But there's these little tiles that let you break the rules. Like, like mm. one of them is you can, instead of, you always are supposed to pull two cards right next to one another adjacent, but sometimes you want two purple cards that are apart from one another. So you have this tile that allows you to do it. One of the tiles lets you uh, draw two cards and then place a window in the same movement because you usually have you have two things you can do. You can place a tile by paying its cost of cards or you can collect cards and you normally get two. There's another tile that lets you pick up three cards. There's another tile that lets you lets you pay one less resource card to buy a tile. There's also a really neat uh, thing that I love about the game that gives you these interesting choices is if you place a tile of the same color next to another pile, not, not, not diagonal, but adjacent, you can actually get a discount of one card. But there's these shields and these, these crests that you cover. And when you do that, that's where you're able to get these tiles that help you break the rules or give you more tiles. Um, once you use those tiles once, you have to flip it over and it's expended. But by going to one of these crests, you can re-energize that. You can refresh it. Uh, if you have three of them and you've used them all, you can refresh all of them at once, which is really cool. Um, so there's, you could also get a tile that's just a one window tile to fill in a hole of something you didn't fix, you did, didn't complete. And you get points for going across, points for going up, whether they're all windows or not windows. So that's the creative part of it. I don't know. i just having a lot of fun with it. Uh, it's simple to teach. People seem to like it. Yeah. Um, I'm just a little concerned if, if it'll wear out its welcome after a while. But more than likely, they'll hopefully come up with some extra, an expansion that creates some additional variability maybe. Yeah, but, it does sound like it's open to that. Yeah. So, fingers crossed. And maybe some baggies as well to put your components in because <laughs> Yeah. I hear that it doesn't come with baggies. Ooh. Oh, it came with a it came with a great big cloth draw bag that all the Oh I... yeah. So that was oh no it didn't. No, no. I'm thinking of uh I'm thinking of something else. Yeah. Kitan, Carcazon. Uh we played Azul last night too, so ah, that's probably what it was. That's probably what it was, yeah. All right, so that's uh, Copenhagen from Queen Games. Cool. Okay, this next game that I'm going to talk about is a cooperative game where players are trying to put cards of colours next to each other. But the thing is, they can't see what those colours are because they're all uh, put in a grid. Um, blah, 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 four, is it four by four grid? At randomly face down and players on their turn will be able to look at one of these cards and then they have this like 
uh, a little tableau of, well, not tableau, but they have a few cards placed on the side. And these cards um, have some clues on them, but colours. So one card might have a be split in half and be green and blue, or another card might be green, blue, and red, or one card might be blue entirely. So if the card that you looked at was blue, then you take the card which is blue and you place it on top of this face down card to say that it's blue. And so you're cooperatively working together to try and put the four cards of the four colors together and you can move them about. So you can, you look at a card, you put it down, you take one of these other cards, place it on top of a card. It doesn't have to be the card that you looked at and then you swap and move two cards around. So you, this four by four grid might turn into like a rectangle or it might turn into a star shape. And you are cooperatively, try, as I said, trying to put all the cards of the same color so they're touching each other. This is a memory game. But you're not allowed to talk. It's and kind of loud to talk. This, you're not these are all the things I hate. Not being able to talk <laughs> and having to remember crap. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so this is a game not for you. Uh, I don't have a clue, actually, what this is. Yeah, it doesn't look like anyone in the chat has uh, uh, has a clue either. It's a game called Yokai. Yokai, uh, a new game. Yeah, a new game from Banzai Editions. Um, I had the privilege of playing this uh, a little while ago. <laughs> um, as I said, it's it's kind of a nabi. Dice yeah, Odyssey yeah. has a fun statement. You can pop up. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> It's called, it's called mental. mental. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And so, as I said, you're just basically creating, putting the four colors in oh, it's order cool. next to really each other. Really cool art. That's gorgeous. Yeah, it's really nice art. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it, it is cooperative, and you have to, as you can see, the cards there, you got the half and half. And it's like, okay, how do I communicate that this card is red when you've got a, a red and a green on it and so there's like this kind of like whole subliminal kind of communication that you have to do with the other players um to try and to try and do it and try and do it in the quickest amount of turns as possible as well that's the other big challenge because when when the this little deck of clue cards runs out that's it it's game over hmm well what's the time how long does it take to play well, it depends how long your telepathy powers run. <laughs> Probably about 10, 15, 20 minutes because it's it's really quick. You've got about, I think there's 12 clue cards. Hmm. Well, I don't know. Um, it's definitely not in my wheelhouse. I'm going to I'm gonna say not so good or not so bad. I mean, not, not so, so bad. bad. Uh, this is a tough one. It kind of falls between the not so bad and uh, a good game. Um, I like the idea. Um, it was, you know, that at the end of the game when we actually did form everything and we, we did manage to kind of see eye to eye with this nonverbal communication um, and get everything in the right place. And we like had a victory, but it was the worst victory because it was like the last round. Um, so, yeah, it was like a hand in the air. Woo! So I enjoyed it, that moment. But it, as a game, I don't know if I play it regularly. Um um, we, I think we prefer things like the mind and Hanabi as a kind of kind of uh, telepathic game with our own little cheating rules. Um, I, I can see this one getting wearing a bit thin after a while, whereas for some reason Hanabi doesn't wear thin. You just want to try and do it again and do it better. Yeah, uh, but yeah, yeah. This, this, this was quite hard, uh, and we were very lucky to have completed it. Huh, interesting. Hmm. Well, I've got another game that is – it is bridging the gap between hobbies. It takes a whole nother group of, of enthusiasts, hobby enthusiasts. Uh, and you're having hot flashes, are you? Oh, yes, yes. It's because Kabuki's not on form again. She just hasn't got any of the games tonight. Oh. Well, you've got all these games that seem obscure to us sometimes. But well, okay, so the game that I've played, it's bringing. <laughs> Two different groups of hobbyists together 
in one fantastic experience. And not only that, this game is designed by a female board game designer and the art is done by a female board game uh, artist, which is amazing. Uh, this particular game is has had all kinds of buzz in the hobby. So I've probably already given it away at this point, but it, it has a theme that I've not really seen uh, in, a, in a game. There was one particular game that had something kind of like it, uh, but this is very specific. The artwork is gorgeous. I love it. I think the, 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 the design is very interesting as well. Uh, this game was uh, produced and way under forecasted and became incredibly uh, in high demand. Does anybody have a guess? Um, Dice Odyssey says Wingspan, which is what I thought it sounded like, but I think you've reviewed that already. I don't think so. We've talked about it anyway. Yeah, we may have talked about it. Um, uh, it is Wingspan. Uh, Wingspan is designed by Elizabeth Hargrave. It just won the, the Kenner Spiel de Jaris Award which is a very prestigious strategy game award. Uh, Wingspan is, the artwork is done by Beth Sorbel. Um, I just think uh, this design, I, I just, all the kudos in the world to, to see the, this, you know, getting some female designers and artists some recognition and for their achievements, I just think is wonderful. Um, I really do. I think it's just, uh, we need more of it. We really do. There's so many talented people that can can do so many things, and I'd love to see that happening, actually. Uh, the artwork, to me, I, I paint wildlife, and so the art style with the watercolors is, is particularly interesting to me. Uh, we feed a lot of birds in, in our home, uh, so we have bird feeders all over the place, and when I see one of these native birds, like the red-breasted grosbeak, uh, I love reading the little fun facts on the bottom of the card. So what's happening is these birders that are in bird game in, uh, enthusiasts, they love this. And it's, it's bringing these people into a game that is not overly complex, but has a lot of choices. And you basically in this game, you have four things you're going to do on your turn. You're either going to place a card in one of the three zones, or you're going to do one of the actions from these three zones. You're going to gain uh, bait or food from these from the resource track, or you're going to uh, get eggs from the grassland uh, track, or you're going to get extra cards that give you more birds from the uh, bottom water land. Uh, the the one thing that I think is really cool that I just love about this game is that each full round, one of your actions goes away. So you're having decreasing actions as the game progresses. Um, every time we've played this game, I've just had a blast. We we just played it again uh, with my, my uh, uh, son-in-law and daughter uh, last week. So I just gave it away. But what do you think I think about this game? Oh, you love it. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> hard to... Hard to uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of people going, ah, I just don't see it. I don't like the hype and, and all that. And it's like, well, there's a reason that it was in so much demand. Um, mm. There's a reason that um, that it won this prestigious award. Um, I really do believe the hype. I love it. I, I've i played it probably five times, which just like I, I, I said, we played Copenhagen. I've played Wingspan. I hardly ever get play games more than once but it's just like we've all wanted to play it and mm -hmm. it was Kay King who introduced the game to me and she made all these 3D printed uh, bits for all the resources which I, I think is really adds another notch to the game over the cardboard uh, the only knock I have on the game is I hate that cardboard birdhouse <laughs> it's just so stupid um, it's, I, I don't like the way it works and, and, and all that. And I don't like the way you have to put it away. So, uh, we're going to make our, our own cool game topper compatible Topper's. dice tower 
that's way cooler. That's just the way that's gonna go. Yeah, that that was the one shining aspect for me was the the bird tower. I thought that was a nice little twist on a dice tower. Uh, unfortunately, the dice were too big for the dice tower. And you have to it's, pump them in the back to it. You yeah. don't put them. You know, it's just. Oh, but again, that it's aesthetically nice. I mean, yeah. I, I I didn't believe the hype. Um, I played it and I found it was an okay game. There were some nice mechanics. It had a great theme. I loved the theme, but I was disappointed with the the material. Some of it was stellar. Some of it was below par. I mean, worse. You know, the worst kind of Stegmire pieces and bits and very thin paper thin cardboard boards for players and stuff. And I was like, what the? This is not Stonemire. What's going on here? Yeah, our but player that, boards are really good, but the the the, the universal scoring board, that little yeah, square well, board, that's just like that was yeah. really cheap. There's no design in it, and I was like, okay. But as I said, the game was pretty good. Um, uh, I played a bad strategy. I picked one of my gold cards, which was like one of the hard ones, and I won because my friend had an easy strategy and he lost. Which is strange. Um, and luckily, the cards that I needed came out in the deck. Otherwise, in a two-player game, you're not going to get a lot of a, a lot of cards are not going to be shown. So, if you're going for uh, a particular, you know, birds with a uh, color in their name, you've got to be lucky from the luck of the draw. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. It, it's an okay game. It's I, I like it because it's birds as well, and I'm a bit of a bird watcher myself. So. Yeah, I, I I just think it's a lot of fun, and I I really I agree that it's probably not it it's not my favorite game of all time or anything mm. like that, but I definitely think it's a good game mm. and uh, well worth taking a look at. That's Wingspan from Stonemeyer Games. Why not working? I can't scroll pictures. There we go. Scrolling pictures. That's not what you want. You're going to do some babbling now about... Uh, uh, you have one more to go, don't you? No. Only... Two... You did two games? I did two games. What two games? You, you just did the, the memory Cro game. In, in Crokinole. Oh, Crokinole. Yeah, it was yeah. so simple and quick. Okay, yeah. yeah. We're going to move right on to our, our sponsorship by our good friends at Arcane Wonders. Arcane Wonders is doing some crazy awesome stuff. This year, their titles are, are really fantastic. They have the land, air, and sea. Uh, it's a quick quick little area, uh, kind of con uh, segmented card game where it's a two versus two player game going back and forth, and you have these three different areas uh, that you're, you're maneuvering. Super fun, quick little game. Of course, they, they at Gen Con, launched the new Dragon Scales. Dragon Scales is a Richard Launius design. They've been working on a long time. I actually got to play this several uh, years ago when we were play testing, and now it's come to market. It's rethemed. It's it's just this fa fabulous cooperative adventure type game, but you can have a winner in there, and and uh, the artwork is really fantastic. You'll t take a look at dragon scales i'm going over that quickly because i want to move on to something new that's coming out for them and this new game is called foundations of rome foundations of rome is designed by emerson matsuchi um emerson man what a fantastic designers and what a great human being i uh, love him to death i have many opportunities to play games with him and meet him at different conventions he designed century spice road and and Spectre Ops and many other games. Uh, in my opinion, just a fantastic designer. I am so pumped. I've seen the actual miniatures from Foundation of Rome. It's a city building game. Yeah, look at that. Wow. wow. It's off the hook. Another notch. Bam, bam, for Arcane <laughs> Wonders. Um, I know they're bringing this to Kickstarter coming up in November. So it's not very far around the corner, but um, I think you're going to be seeing a lot of buzz about this particular game. And Game Toppers, we're actually going to be helping them make a custom designed three millimeter premium mat uh, for the game as well. So super pumped about it. Um, they are our sponsors, so obviously I'm biased about this, but want you to be fully aware of that. But 
everything I've seen about this is really going to be fantastic. And it's going to have that quality Arcane Wonders touch. So check them out at arcanewonders.com. Do, 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 do. And here we are, ladies and gentlemen. I'm taking His Royal Highness for a lovely stroll through the, the nearby forest. Well, it's actually a wood because there's a difference between woods and forests. I think that forests, bears can crap in them, but they can't crap in the woods. Or it's the other way around. I can't remember. But anyhow, here we are in the woods of Evergreen. And we're admiring the games which came out. <clears throat> I did. I did correct this. I thought you had a drop for this. Yes, on my computer, but not on my CD, and I have no CD on. But my you told me computer. about how awesome of a thing you made for this. Yes, you know. You you told me this, Jester Badger. Now you're letting me down. I put it in your favorite royal color of purple on the screen yeah. here. So anyway, this is another be... steaming pile of crap we're hearing right now. <laughs> we're going to be upgrading on the uh, Steam Monkey. We'll Steam do it Yard. next week. We'll do it Steamer. next week. We'll do it next week. <laughs> yeah, so we're walking through the woods of Evergreen, admiring the games from 2010. We've both chosen three games, which we believe are still Evergreen titles, uh, which have survived the, the nine years. We're getting closer. Should we should we really do a 2019? I don't know. This yeah, this probably. is a game that we think is going to survive. Yeah, well, okay. I don't know. We'll anyway. have to, that that that'll have to be a we'll have to get some feedback from the wonderful inhabitants of Babylon. Yes, I'm sure there's someone in the crowds, maybe in the park, the or in the marketplace. Maybe someone in the dungeon has a good idea. Yeah, possibly, mm. possibly. I don't take much stock in them. <laughs> so, uh, this tree was planted in 2010. It has a little plaque on it, um, which uh, has a, a, a number and a word, and it's called Seven Wonders. This is the Seven Wonders tree. Now, I'm going to say straight off the bat, I do not like Seven Wonders. <laughs> I've uh, wow. given it a very low rating. I don't enjoy playing it for some strange reason. I, 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 I Why is this in your list of, of your top ever? Because it is a game that has, you know, it's an evergreen title. People are still playing this wonderful no, game. No, but these are, these are like our favorites. Okay, I've got to change my whole list then. Yeah, I? you're you're full <laughs> of bunk here. You're full of bunk here. But I, I, couldn't, I couldn't pass it up. I mean, I looked at the other games from 2010. I thought... Uh yes. I yes. passed it right up. I passed it right up. It's but it's a nice tree. Okay. It has some very nice artwork. It's a very good idea. I just don't enjoy playing it. I find it time consuming. So um, why are we talking about it in the woods because of Evergreen? So many people love it. This is not the Woods of Evergreen ah. for, for everyone else. This is our Woods our of Evergreen. Woods of Evergreen. Uh, this is your Woods of Evergreen. You're breaking but the rules. I'm breaking the rules. I, sorry, sorry. I, <laughs> which finger would you like to cut off this week? <laughs> All of them. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> no, I, I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. Uh I could have easily put Seven Wonders because I do like Seven Wonders. We're only picking three of the games that we like that we think stand the test of time for us. No. So yeah. I'm going to give my first one. This is one of the games that was one of the first Kickstarter games uh, that, that put Kickstarter, in my mind, on the radar as far as the gaming hobby. Uh, uh, this game is Alien Frontiers. Oh, okay. uh, This game was so fantastically produced with all the bits and bobs, as you would say. Uh, the dice rolling and the dice placement and all of the different things you could do to mitigate those dice, especially with the subsequent expansions that came out. Um, this game was initially produced by Game Salute. Now, I'm not sure if it's under the new Starling Games title or not, but I just love this game. Uh, thought it was fantastic. Uh, we've always had great fun playing it, and it still holds up really well for me. 
Mm. Yeah, I've played it and I enjoyed it. Um, I just haven't got around to buying it. One of those games that it's like, oh, yeah, but I've got this other dice game over here which does the same similar thing. Um, what's it called? Yeah. Uh, but anyway, I can't remember what it's called. Well, there's but, yeah. so many new dice games that have all these you know, creative mechanisms, but a lot of them, I think, might have started building on Alien Frontiers. And for me, anyway, it, yeah. it really holds up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. My, was this my number one or my number two? <laughs> yeah, I think you need to... Need to need, how, did you have an honorable mention? Because you could you could you could use Seven Wonders as an honorable mention. I'll give you a pass on that. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll make up another one. Okay, <laughs> one I want to mention is Forbidden Island, um, a Matt Ooh. Leacock game that I quite enjoy. Um, it's I really island. I really like your graphic there because on the right there it says you can late pledge for a game cover. <laughs> Well done, Scott. You right on BGG. You points. you couldn't have done that any better, my friend. <laughs> oh, I'm going to die hard on this, I tell you. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Forbidden Island. Um, without Forbidden Island, there would be no Forbidden Desert, which is my preferred version of the game. But yeah, Forbidden Island is a, a nice idea of an island sinking and your team of players have got to go around the island, which is sinking and find objects and then get off the, the island before it sinks entirely or if someone dies. Um, it's fun. It's relatively quick to play within about 30 minutes. Uh, it comes with some nice pieces, some nice artwork, and a yeah. nice tin. It comes in a tin. which something uh, like. I hate the but tin. I like the tin. I hate uh, the tin. I like the tin. I just wish it was a normal size so yeah. it fit right. Yeah. So That's a good game. Go. Yeah. Good game. Uh, my number two is a game that my family absolutely loves. Uh, another dice game, surprisingly. Uh, you're using dice to build hotels, and it's called Lords uh, of Vegas. Vegas. Mm. Lords of Vegas from, I believe it's Mayfair Games did that, right? Yeah. Um, it's, we, I'll play that game anytime anybody wants to play it. I love the way it works. We love the, the competition, the bidding. I love those kind of mechanisms, uh, uh, getting zones, uh, where you can put them. I just think it's super fun. Hey, Rick is in the castle yard. Ooh, he's in the yard, is he? Yeah, Couple he's of in steam, the yard. Is it? Uh, he may be a steaming. He's shoveling the steaming piles of poo in the dong gate area. Yeah, well, that's why he's fashionably late. Yeah, it's fashionably late because he's been <laughs> shoveling it. <laughs> so, Lords of Vegas, uh, you have all these different colors. You have all these different uh, zones. You're trying to kind of build upon one another. Um, I don't know. It's just, it's been a while since I've played Lords of Vegas, but it has very good memories. <laughs> Dice Odyssey says, hey, oh, Rick, welcome to the dungeon. <laughs> oh, sorry, castle. <laughs> I like I like the casino uh, too there where you're, you've got a little bit of a push your luck aspect and, you know, your auction and all of those kind of things. And it, it's super fun. Yeah. Cool. Okay, let's try and find my other game, which is on here. I've played it a few times. It's a dice game um, called Troyes. Oh, I've never played that, but I see it all the time. I mean, Toi. Toi. Oh, my. Toi, yes. It's um, in the Champagne capital of France. Well, it's part of the Champagne capital. Um, the old castle, you're build, building the cathedral. Um, and you're using dice as your workers. Some of them are religious, some of them are uh, uh, warrior cast, and some of them are um, merchants. And you'll be using your dice to perform actions, and the game evolves as you play. Hmm. New, new actions come available, and there's new ways to get points or multiply your money. But at the same time, you're not just working against the other players, you're actually working cooperatively because at the beginning of every round, Bandits and raiders will attack the city. And so you have to work together or not work together to fight them off 
Otherwise, there'd be penalties for each player. But if you fight them off, you're using one of your workers. And if you want your workers to do an action, you're a bit... Yeah. So um, it's it's a game which I haven't really mastered and fully understood because the icons are a, a bit of a puzzle sometimes. I forget what they do and what they're doing. And But um, it's, a, it's a very thinky, non... I wasn't going to say non luck fest, but it is a very thinky, puzzly, straight, kind of dry game. Um, one of the ones that I like, and I need to play a lot more. And people keep talking about this game um, as well. I think there's something in the works. There's a twa right and roll or, or something coming. So look out for that. Wow, that looks like a game I would like. Hmm. Yeah, okay. I've never played that. That's That's good information. I should try to... Look it up. Well, I should add that to my shelf of shame. That's what oh, I should do. Oh, no, with. no. You should get someone to play it with you and teach you how to play it. That's what I want. Yes. I'll, I'll have uh, Trey Lennox and Mariana Lennox, some of my favorite people to play games with when we go to yep. conventions, and they love playing older games. Oh, all right. Okay. <laughs> so my... With, with my older people. My, no? Yes. Yeah, so, well... Uh, a distinguished gentleman. Experienced, distinguished people. Mileaged people. Mileage, yes. Yes, there's, <laughs> it's not the age, it is the mileage. Yeah. Yes. High miles, but still runs well. Yes. <laughs> you said so. Uh, this is a pickup deliver game. And... You know why pirate jokes are funny, don't oh, you? Oh, no. You're not talking about merchants and marauders, are merchants you? Merchants and marauders just uh, are. They just are. Uh, I love this game. Super fun. Um, um, I, 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 I love the pickup and deliver aspect of it. I love the movement of the game. I like the different resources that create a lot of variability. I love the theme. I like the components. Uh, every time we've played this game, you know, you have to be prepared. It's a little bit of take that in there because uh, mm -hmm. your plans can get foiled. And uh, you have the black ship running around. So you have some competition in this game. But every time we've played it, it's, it's a little on the long side. Uh, you know, you can play it in a couple hours, but sometimes a little longer than that. But Merchants and Marauders, man, I haven't played the expansion. There's like a Commander of the Seas or something like that expansion. Okay. Um, I don't think I, we hit – my son owns this game. I don't actually have it. I, I can't remember if we got the expansion for him or not, but I would love to play Merchants and Marauders again. Hmm. Okay. So that's my third. That's your third. Okay. My third. My third would have been another game, but it's not very popular. No. <laughs> oh. Well. <laughs> but there is this Neither one. are we. Neither are we. <laughs> <laughs> My third would be Hanabi. Oh, that... I hate that game. Yeah. I have good memories of this game and enjoy playing it, especially on a game topper. Where they have the the little lip where you can rest the cards on. So oh, it's perfect play. for the it's perfect oh. for the card rail. Yeah, that's a good. Yes, point. it is. It's it's we enjoy it. Um, it's it's a fun challenge, especially when we introduce our daughter and she likes playing it. And she's like a random element. She doesn't fully understand our system of how we cheat, uh, how we win. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a nice game of just arranging the cards in order without talk. Well, with clues but without talking and without signs and anything it's fun um and i think this was the gateway game to the game i think for me i was just like yeah such yeah, fun I, we played it several times we were actually on vacation in florida but uh it just didn't click with us as a family but that's a that's a uh, the spiel de jars winner right as well yeah so people love yeah. it it's just not quite my thing yeah, yeah, you got to be into trying to figure out. Oh, that's a picture I took from the um, uh, 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 tournament that I was in. Oh, there's my green jumper on the uh, on the thing there. 
Oh, cool. Where uh, are you? Yeah. Did you? Did you jump out of it? Uh, yeah. Well, once you've played your game, you have to walk away quietly so the other players can play their game. So uh, that's what we did. Well, hmm. there we have another segment of the Woods of Evergreen Yay. from the year 2010. And with that, we are going to move on to our new segment called The Babble. It's brand new, except <laughs> we've done it before. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I was but, trying to think it's like... But, but, <laughs> I was trying to think it's like Trumpy there to say. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's the most luxurious segment that you'll ever hear. Trust me, believe it. If you listen to this, your ratings will go up. <laughs> it's huge. It's huge. It's the babble. <laughs> babble, 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 um, as a gamer, I mean, what do you would hope to achieve by being a gamer? What do you want to do uh, to stop being a gamer, maybe? <laughs> For example, <laughs> <laughs> you may want to uh, stop buying games as a goal, or you may wish to play more games with other people. We just want to find out what uh, you guys set as goals. We have, we have a little – I have a little list – I hope you got a little list. Well, I have a list, but it's a very simple list. A very simple list yes. of goals that we should aim for or what we want to aim for because, you know, this hobby is, is changing like a, like, a, like a snake over oil. Well, um, I think what, what, kind of, what kind of prompted our discussion about this and we thought maybe it would be a good topic, um, we don't think about things very right very often, but – um, when we discuss no, we this, rightly. no, no, of course not. No, no, no rightly no. thinking. Complete yeah. nonsense. Complete Le pile of steaming stuff. Lefties. Yes. 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 That's what we are. No, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. My blue suede shoes. Uh huh. So uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. You guys don't see what's going on in the chat, do you? Uh -huh. okay. Because no, you're, right. you're hearing this and not seeing it unless you're watching live uh, on YouTube. Uh -huh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Give me some sugar, baby. Uh -huh. <laughs> Need some fried ba banana sandwiches and peanut butter. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, All right. you. <laughs> Can you make the words well, what, what, what prompted this discussion was... You know, we see a lot of these uh, goals that are being presented out on primary like Facebook groups where they'll say, have you tried the 10 by 10 challenge, meaning you're going to play 10 games 10 times? Well, that would be a gamer goal. Uh, there, there are other goals that people make. And you take some of the new apps, for instance, like with the Board Game Geek app that allows you to track your plays. And then because you're tracking your plays, people have goals. They, they may have goals to play a, a certain game so many times or to achieve a certain uh, score in a game. Or uh, their buying habits can be a goal. And so there's been a lot of input. Um, you can tell us your little story, if you want there, Badger, about, uh, about a question you recently uh, pitched on the Board Game Geek Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yes, I, I, I was trying to reach out and get some some answers to our question. And so uh, this morning, well, no, it wasn't this morning. It was yesterday morning. I posted on Board Game Geek the question to try and get some feedback so we could talk about it on this show. And boy, uh, did you get a lot of feedback. I got a lot of feedback, but from the wrong question. I, <laughs> I put uh, what gaming rules do you have 
uh, <laughs> instead of gaming goals. And um, I didn't even notice this error because when you post it, it goes to the administrators and they have to authorize it before it gets posted on the, the Board Game Geek forum on, on Facebook. And so I waited and waited and waited and then I went to bed that night and then it got posted as I went to bed. And then people answered. <laughs> and then I woke up this morning and thought, oh, they posted it. Oh, people have answered. Oh, the wrong question. <laughs> Deary me. Um, so I, I could have had a, a good 50 responses from people, uh, but I've only got a handful. So, <laughs> um, well, I think it's, uh, I, I actually think that topic, um, actual rules, rules that you have when you play games, that's a fantastic subject and that can be a future babble topic. So we will, we will keep all the, that information and we will utilize it again. It'll be a great poll, that type of thing. So as in house rules, exactly. And we might even call the episode house rules. Um, mm. or, or two in a house or three in a house, depending on how Barry views himself. Yeah. <laughs> it could be six in a house because he's usually five different people. Uh, what film is that? <laughs> Sybil. Sybil. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us, tell us some of your goals then, Badger. Okay, I'll, I'll start on my goals, which I've listed down. down. Um, one of my goals is to try not to be too grumpy. Mm. Barry grumpy what yeah. are you talking about only mm. Dan Hughes is grumpy um no he is not grumpy <laughs> don't <laughs> call him grumpy you can call him frumpy but don't call him grumpy grumpy no uh yeah I kind of get disparaged life has taken a change since having a child and friends moving away so gaming has not been that easy um and to get the family to play together is getting harder and harder and added to that the choice of game to play with the family is getting harder and harder now i'm quite open to playing 80 percent of the games that i have here at the drop of a hat because there's sometimes there's a game that you know doesn't fit right but between my daughter and my wife they have their own different 10 percent of the games that they want to play and you can imagine the amount of time it takes for us to decide what game to play because one of them said let's play this the other one say no the other one say yeah let's play this and they said no and this kind of deflates me and in the end you know after about five minutes i start to say well forget it let's let's go and watch a dvd let's watch captain america again Ugh. so mm -hmm. i i kind of get grumpy in that kind of you know, I, I, you know, just put a game on the table and I'll play it. Sometimes that does happen. Sometimes one of them will put a game on the table. Uh, like recently we played Steam Park together and we had fun and we played it again the next night because we had so much fun. Um, but I just get into this, such this grump that sometimes when the game does hit the table, I don't want to play anymore. I've had enough. I, I just want to move on and forget the whole thing. <laughs> um, so I'm like standing on my own foot there in a way. So I've got to, I want to try and not be grumpy when it comes to that choosing a game and it takes forever. I just, I just want to put a game on the table and play it. Well, I have a, I have a very simple goal. I think that's a good goal, Barry. Um, my simple you're just, goal. You're just is, saying that to stop making me grumpy. Yeah. Um, I, I, I've never, I've never really seen you that grumpy. So you're surprising me by your discussion topics. But okay. I, re I do realize that you know, if you, uh, I have two grandchildren and they want to play games, uh, but they don't know how to play games because they're three and one. Mm -hmm. But sometimes the amount of time that it takes to get through a game because we're pausing all the time to deal with something uh, with the kids, um, it, it can make you a little bit, the game gets moving so slow, it's hard to concentrate and it kind of can make you a little grumpy and yet you're enjoying the time with family. So it's, I, I get, I, I can understand that. Mm -hmm. um, where one of my goals is just really simple. I just want to play more games. I have a goal to play more games. 
Um, and I wish I could quantify it. I wish I could quantify and say I would like to play 20 more games by the end of the year. Um, my goal is always to get through my shelf of opportunity, as Scott Morris talks from Chris <laughs> Happen would say. He doesn't like saying shelf of shame. But when I look at all the games that that I've spent money on or that I've been given, and, and I, I know that I just don't have the bandwidth to sit down and play it because I'm exhausted from my day or just physically don't have the time because I work late into the night a lot of times. Um, my goal is to get through those games. Um, I want to play more games. And if, if I could cut my shelf of opportunity down by half by the end mm. of the year, I would be thrilled with that. If half of those games could have gone into play status and I decide whether or not I'm going to keep them or move on, I would love that. Yeah, yeah. It is It is quite disheartening to see all those games and think, oh, I don't want to play that, but there's no one to play with. Or, I haven't got the time to play it. And, well, I, I, I almost feel guilty. It's like I walk by that shelf every night and I, I see it right in my game room. And it's like I almost want to take that whole shelf and move it in the other room so I don't ever have to think about it. Because when I walk by it, I go, oh, I really need to play those games. And I know I don't have the ability to, you know, a lot like I'd like. So that you, it kind of frustrates me. Have you thought about like mixing it in with your game collection? Like what I do. It's like, yes, that, that's a perfect space for that game. But I haven't played it yet. <laughs> no, I can't do that. And then I... Yeah. Well, we had a discussion. Um, my son had some of his friends coming over and he's playing Battletech, but he's made kind of a derivative of Battletech where it has a fantasy role playing or a Battletech role playing aspect where we all role play the first part using kind of like some other role playing mechanisms to build the backstory. And then we actually get into the Battletech exercise. Well, it was really fun. Uh, we had a good time doing it, and I hadn't played Battletech before, but it was kind of interesting. But I was telling all the people, I said, we used to game every Tuesday night, and then that group kind of fell apart as I got really busy, and and then uh, it was super clever, uh, Kabuki. Um, Josiah just does such an amazing job with story-driven things, and he gets into the voice. The story's well-written. It's It was so fun. We had a big fight big brawl because we were we were some of the cadets that had lost and so I came in I was the big bruiser and uh, one of my compatriots picked a fight well the other guy got smart ass and so what did I have to do I had to get in there and pick a fight with him so I'm not a fighter I'm a lover okay I'm a lover <laughs> uh, but that's what happened in the role playing um, and uh, I, I did a wrestling move on him and I did roll a crit and I separated his shoulders so there so there's a little animosity amongst the cadets, and now we have to do training missions. So okay. it's a very interesting story-driven battle tech. Okay, that all said, um, I, I mentioned to Jesse, uh, who was there that, that night. Rick mentions him. Uh, uh, and, 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 Rick, and Jesse, he just wanted to eat his supper. That's all he wanted. <laughs> he did not want to get in this bar all, but it happened nonetheless. No. So, um, but I mentioned, I said, we really need to try to get back to regular gaming nights because without the gaming nights, it's so hard to ever think about getting those games to the table. And so I have a goal to set up a regular gaming, scheduled gaming nights. Cool. Which kind of leads me into mine. Yeah. Which is practically the same thing. Um, uh, my goal is to, uh, get off my behind and make friends and get the association running again. Um, there, there you go. There you go. My, I have an association, I started an association some years ago in my village, um, because the... Is it called the village people? Why MCA? Why MCA am I talking to you? That's what I want to know. Uh, <laughs> I like the village people. You do a good job of them. <laughs> you, should, you can do it. 
You yes, can do uh, it. My association is called Paradis Ludic. Which is, oh, uh, Paradis play, Ludic. <laughs> playful Paradise. Ludic. So I started that <laughs> years ago um, in the in the community center here in my my village. Um, it went around quite well. We have about 15 people that turn up or don't turn up, uh, which can be disheartening. Uh, you know, you, you prepare a day or an evening for gaming and nobody turns up because of whatever they forgot or they they have prior arrangements with someone else um sundays is not a good time to to organize a event because sundays is normally family time so people like visit their grandparents and have dinner with them and the french dinners go on for hours and hours friday nights is not good because it's Friday nights. What do people do in Friday nights? Normally they go clubbing or they, they, they get extremely drunk in a bar. But, um, yeah, so I am pushing myself to get the association started again. Um, I was contacted last week by another guy who has an association in another village, the other side of the big town. And he said, why don't we get together and form one association? I said, yeah, that's a good idea because I need someone like me. Uh, to teach games because I'm the only one that teaches games on top of that I teach it in a very bad French on top of that I don't get to play because I'm teaching the game hopefully this will work um, if we get this running soon um, and so we'll have a, like a regular game night and regular family game day because you can't really play when there's kids around you know, mm -hmm. it's eight o'clock in the evening. Yeah, they're right. Eight o'clock in the evening, they're playing a few little games. Nine o'clock in the evening, they start running around the room, screaming, jumping up and down, taking bits out of the box and then putting them back in the wrong space. And then the people that brought those games go, ah! um, and just until midnight, it's it's carnage. And you, you become a teacher and you, <laughs> you don't enjoy your game and you don't enjoy teaching. Um, so... Yeah, Hopefully. different stages of life for families. It, it really can can be difficult with gaming when you have young children. Uh, it's just a whole different stage of life. That uh, in that stage of life for us, when I had the computer company and had young children, that was not a gaming stage of season of life for me. No, no. And so uh, yeah, that's why I pulled the plug. We had the little Robin, uh, which meant that I was doing this all on my own because normally my wife would help as well she'd come along and she chin wag with all the other people and you know lighten the atmosphere with her friendly banter and and jokiness while i talk games uh, it was we, we had something really funny happen with my grandson philip is three years old and he's just starting to really talk a lot and uh, my my son-in-law was kidding with him and he says you don't want grandpa to come over and have game night do you you don't like games. And he goes, but I do like games. I do like games. <laughs> he was so excited when I walked it, when I drove up in the driveway and he just couldn't wait that he could get up on that table. And they have one of my first prototype uh, game toppers and he loves to throw the dice and we always give him some of his own components to play. So he feels like he's enjoying it too. Yeah. So tell us about some of the goals that some of our other friends uh, have commented on. And then everybody that's in the chat, if you have some goals, please let us know what you think as well. Yeah, yeah. So let's see if I can do this. Here we go. We had uh, one people that answered on Facebook, um, Crastio Dimivo. Uh, sorry. Krastev. Dimov Krastev? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, they have the same kind of thing as you. They want to bring their SOS, Shuffle of Shame, down to zero. Almost impossible, I know. But if you keep trying, I'm sure that it will happen. Just hide your wallet. Um, lock yourself in your house when friends <coughs> come over and play through that pile as quick as you possibly can. Well, so we go to Gen Con and and I don't I really haven't bought very many games this last last two years. Very few other than 
I've backed quite a few Kickstarters, surprisingly. Uh, so I've gotten games in, but a lot of them are my friends in the industry that I want to support. And, and so I've gotten games in like Dragon Boats uh, from Daryl Andrews from Maple Games came in and Guardians Call from, from uh, Druid City Games came in. And uh, I, I got estates have come in from uh, Capstone Games. And that game looks so fantastic to me, but I haven't played it yet. Um, so I have these have these different games that have come in from Kickstarter, but generally I'm not buying games. But at Gen Con, I actually worked out a trade to get a copy of Batman, the mm. full blown version, uh, for mm. trading for a couple of my game mats. Well, that seemed like a really he was a game topper owner, and I thought that was a good thing. Um, I got Dragon Scales. Uh, I got the new architecture from Arcane Wonders. I I got uh, Edge of Darkness from AEG. Mm. Ah, no! This thing looks amazing. Um, I mean, I, I, I got God of War from uh, Come On. I, uh, I mean, I, I ended up, I, I put a picture of it, I think, on Facebook. But I came home with like 10 games and Josiah looks at me, oh, Run, Fight, or Die from Gray Fox Games, <laughs> yeah. the new version. Um, I also got uh, the game, uh, oh, I just lost it, from Breaking Games. It's a city-building game, Expansicity. Um, I got all these cool games, and Josiah looks at me and goes, Dad, I don't think you understand how this works. Um, you're not supposed <laughs> to be adding games. And I said, I know, I know, but I can't help it. <laughs> mm, yeah, that's not how it works, Jeff. Ah. Uh, oh. So, Will Stoker. This is the guy that was in the movie Iron Will. Will Stoker. From okay. the movie Iron Will. Um, fam famous dog sledding racing game uh, and movie. Very, okay. very, very famous. Iron Will. Okay. Will Stoker. I don't know if that's a joke or the truth. <laughs> it's the truth. It's and the it's truth. A joke, and it's a joke. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you listen here, Boyka. You get frostbite. It'll look like this. I'll help you cut off any finger you want, Boyka. <laughs> okay, so Will Stocker <laughs> says, uh, my friends and I try to play a game at least two or three times before we give up on it. And even more than that, if we're playing, reviewing it on our channel. Oh, we also point. try... We also try to keep cell phones at a minimum, if possible, because that can get annoying for some players, which is true. Yep. Yes. Guilty. <laughs> Man, when you're working all the time and you're on call, then yes, it, it can be annoying. I, I um, like that. I really like his thought there, though. I, I like the fact that they're talking about playing a game more than once, two yeah. to three times. I, I think it's even a good goal to play the game at different player counts, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, because you get a different feel with games all the time with different players and different player counts and different locations. I mean, you could be sat on a comfy chair or a squeaky chair, and you'll the same game will feel completely different. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you could drink Cherry Coke or you can drink Pepsi and do that challenge, and the game will feel different. Hmm. But no, no, seriously. Um, yeah, just playing at different counts does change well, that, the game. That's an interesting thought, changes. too. Playing, playing games with different people, the same game with different people. Oh, yeah, that, which that's is something which I've done a lot of times because I'm always demoing the game. I'm teaching people games, so I get to do that a lot. I'm teaching people Hanabi. So like I've played with about six different groups, and you can see how – different people play the game and think that they, the game should be played or manipulated to win. It's, it's really kind of eye opening. Yeah. But you know, it's like some people are get very comfortable with their own gaming group because you know, people and you can kind of be yourself. And when you got new people, sometimes you're, you know, everybody just acts a little different and, and some games are so player dependent, you know, it's like, I I've had some amazing, super fun games of spoils of war or, or Sheriff of Nottingham, which personally I don't think are that player dependent, but you play that get those games with some people who just don't like to interact, 
Yeah, it, it it's, falls a little flat. It's a dead log in the ocean. It's yeah, I've so many times you just want to try and get people into the theme by the way that you explain the game. And usually that works. But if you just say this is a game, blah, blah, blah. And some people don't grasp the fact that you're supposed to maybe role play a bit or, or you're just supposed to even lie and they just play honestly all the time. They don't have fun in the game. Yeah. Um, you, yeah, different people will change your game experience. I mean, I'm playing a game at the moment, which has gone down twice very poorly and I can't review it because I need to play it a few more times. And hopefully one of those times it will play nicely. And then I'll be able to see the other side of the game and how it works. Yeah. Because in my head, I can see how it's going to work. And oh, it's fun. It's fun playing it solo, but playing it with other people, different characters. Do, do we have a couple other uh, gaming goals from people? Yeah, we do. We have William Angus, who says, no, Angus, you- Angus, how are you, Angus? Angus was in Iron Will, too, by the way. Yeah? Yes, Angus was. You're going to need to watch Iron Will. Okay. Boyka. If I have five minutes, yes, I will watch Iron Will. Uh, He says, no new games until I take a game off my shelf out of shrink wrap and actually play it. Uh, This was a compromise from that rule that was proposed of one in, one out. Yeah, that's a rule, and is it a goal? Yeah. I, don't, I, I wouldn't ever set it because it's an impossible goal. It's an impossible goal. It's an impossible dream. One in, one out. Uh, yeah. at, at the moment here, I'm, I'm, I, I can do it. I'm doing it at the moment. I can't do it. No. I can't even get caught up, much less do it. <laughs> well, I just don't buy any games. If a game comes on my doorstep, then yay! Yeah. What am I going to check out? Uh, it's quite an easy kind of <laughs> uh, um, thing for me to do. Um, I'm dreading tomorrow. Uh, maybe we'll talk about that on the next show. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we have another one. William yeah. Ellis says, I'm moving in with a fellow board gamer next month. We've already set a house rule. So this is kind of rules again here, but for every yeah. game we buy, we have to crack an open one we haven't opened yet and give it a play. So again, this is kind of a rule versus a goal. I don't know. Maybe it's a goal. Yeah, it's a goal. It, you got to aim for it. A rule is a goal, isn't it, really? Nah, a rule is something that you're supposed to adhere to. A goal yeah. is something you're trying to do. Yeah, so if your rule is to obey your rules, then it's a goal. I don't like obeying the rules. No? No, I, we break all like the rules. We're a rebel. We're a rebel with the cause. Ah, oh, right. It's you that drives on the other side of the road. It's you that parks incorrectly. I do you two lines. You turns right in the middle of a road. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm a rebel with a cause. Yeah. I walk across the road on a red light. I've only been hit twice. And that was by your own parked car. <laughs> <laughs> Must remember that rule to put the handbrake on. <laughs> well, there you go. So I don't know. I don't know about that as far as goals. Are there any other creative goals do you think that 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 are are important goals that we should have. Um, I, I had one thought that I wanted to throw out. I, I wanted to have goals of playing with new people. Um, yep. One thing that I really like about going to a convention, I don't know, this this may be me uh, a little bit. Some people can be socially awkward and it's hard for them to engage people. And I can almost spot that kind of personality where someone's feeling uncomfortable or they're all by themselves or, or something like that. Um, and that's I, what attracted you to me. Exactly. That's exactly, <laughs> that's, that's exactly the way it was. You know, you're so awkward and, <sighs> and just, you, you know, you're, you're trying to look comfortable staring at a plotted plant. Uh, is that what you like? So 
Um, no, but I, I love that actually. When, when I see folks like that, if I have the time and whatever, I love to go engage them, even if it's just for a short talk. But if there's a way that I can introduce them to a game or if they have a game they want to play and we can get together and it's, it's always a risk. You never know who you're going to meet. You don't know how, who people are. I understand that. But I actually don't have a whole lot of compunction, uh, uh, adverse compunction about that. I, I actually love to go engage those people. And I've made so many friends. And, and to help people feel important um, to me is, is, is a highlight. So that's a goal that I would like to have personally. I like to play with more people than I've played with before. Yeah, I, I just at an event, just sit down with anyone, it doesn't matter. Um, and that's always nice, you know, you play with someone at an event, and then three years later, you'll pass them by at a different event, and they remember you. You went, Oh, you remember we, we were playing again? And you're like, Okay, oh, yeah, I remember. <laughs> but, um, yeah, that's always a nice moment, and then you just break it open in a chat. Um, I, I'm lucky in that regard, I do get to play with lots of different people all the time. Because as I said, when I go to events, it's just I'm normally a, a kind of a guest instead of a someone working, um, and and that's always nice. How about conventions? Do you have any goals for conventions? No, I don't have it. I don't have any goals. Uh, my goal is to just try and play and have fun. Well, apart from the goals that I've mentioned, is try and play and have fun, not be grumpy, and try and play more. Um, due to the fact that it has kind of dried up here for me. Have you, ever, have you ever done any of those 10 by 10 challenges, those those type of goals? No, I don't see, don't see the point. I mean, if you're going to play a game, you're going to play a game. Um, it's, it's, like, it's like knowing that you've got 55 ounces of steak in your freezer. There's no oh, that point sounds like supper. Yeah, there's no point in just trying to <laughs> eat it every day you know sometimes sometimes i want That's... pizza sometimes i want spaghetti sometimes i want a chinese sometimes i want salad you know yes you can't force feed yourself well how about goals about playing games solo yeah you could do but from my perspective then again that i want to play solo is the seventh continent and so i have it's not kind of like set a goal, but it's like whenever I have time and I'm alone and maybe like uh, the soundtrack is accidentally kicked in on my uh, on iTunes while it's on random. And I go, OK, yeah, I'm going to play. <laughs> I, I, I got my Kickstarter in for uh, Nemo's War. Yeah. And and the secret Jamie from the Secret Cabal just loves Nemo's War solo. He thinks it's the way you should play the game. I I am kind of stoked actually. I put it in the camper. I don't know that I'll I'll be in the camper alone <laughs> to where I could, <laughs> you know, uh to play it, but I I don't really have a desire to play it cooperative. I want to play it solo. So I have a goal to play mm -hmm. Nemo's War. Um I I'm hoping that I'll have the time to do that. Uh, Cause that, that would be a big project for me, learning the rules to the game and playing it by myself. Cause I just don't do that. Hmm. Um, I, the, I, I played Imperial settlers solo mode. And I, at first I was like, I don't like playing by myself here. And, and then all of a sudden the game got really close and I really enjoyed it. So it was kind of weird. Um, so I do have a little bit of a goal to try to do that, but I enjoy being around people much more than I enjoy being around myself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy being around people rather than being around yourself. Yeah, um, so that is why I hire the jester in the kingdom to keep me amused. You, I, I am convinced that I can amuse myself, but I prefer for you to amuse me. But it's, it's harder to set personal goals than it is to set business goals. Business goals, you know, you have an objective and it's that's Good imperative point. that you you have to do it because your business is at stake. You're going to lose money. You may find yourself having to find another job, whereas personal goals, you know, like getting off your ass and going on the treadmill for 30 minutes every day is another kettle of fish. I mean, if I had a game of goal, it would be get off the get off this 
chair here stop being in front of this screen here and and doing composing music and and writing reviews and blogs and and doing translation and talking to people on messenger get out there in that vineyard and have a good old stroll around and watch what's going on see those foxes running around after those rabbits go and look at those professional professional goals and hobby goals are so totally different because necessity demands that if you're going to be successful that you have good uh goals and that you have a game plan to achieve those goals but mm-hmm. for some reason in the hobby this is our spare time we don't take the same approach to the same diligence at least i no don't punishment is there there's no real punishment you yeah i'm still sat on this chair i'm not out there well, what's going to happen well maybe gain a kilo or two yeah, well, there's hey, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, if, anything tomorrow. If we don't achieve our hobby goals, there isn't much downside other than we didn't get to do those things that maybe we wanted to do. But if you don't achieve your professional goals, there's significant consequences. Yeah. So that's that's the rub. So because we 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 work hard to not have those negative consequences professionally, we set goals, we figure out how we can achieve those goals. And if we applied the same diligence that if I applied the same diligence that I did with my business plan about my hobby, Mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't have any problems with with my shelf of shame. But that's secondary. My hobby is secondary first to my family. My hobby is secondary to my my business and livelihood to to provide for my family and my faith. Those things are what are most important to me then it carries over into the hobby. And, and those are all, those are all really good things, but you, we do have to keep things in perspective, right? Yeah, we do indeed. I mean, uh, I could say that one of my gaming goals has been fulfilled because my wife said to me, hey, you earn no money. You earn no money. You buy no games. You buy no games, you get to sleep in the bed. <laughs> That's a goal in itself. That's a goal in itself. So there you go. No money, no games, but I get the bed. Which is better than sleeping in this chair. You have to turn that into a game, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> that will be your gaming goal. <laughs> yeah. Aurora! <laughs> Where are you, Aurora? She's not watching. <laughs> she, won't, uh, she won't ever watch. Uh, Well, I think we've kind of beat this babble topic into the ground. Everybody has different goals. Uh, I think the biggest thing, if you do have a gamer goal, uh, put together a little game plan of how you think you might be able to achieve it. Because without putting a plan, it's said that, you know, those who fail to plan will not ever plan anything again. It goes something like that, I think. And, and if you've, if you don't fail to plan, you plan to fail yeah. or you fail in planning. It's all a big vicious circle. Mm-hmm. So make a plan, achieve your goals, be happy, don't worry. Good words of wisdom. Don't copyright this video. <laughs> so with that, everybody, we just want to thank you again for a fantastic time. Uh, thanks for joining us in the chat, everyone. It's just always such a joy to be able to interact. I just love that. And you never know who's going to show up and we're able to just have some fun with this. This show is going to be produced live in a much more professional manner uh, on iTunes and Stitcher. And you're going to even have a, a YouTube version of it that is professionally audio edited with all of the fancy drops that Barry comes up with. And uh, we would love for you to join and share with that. You can also find us on the Board Game Geek Guild 2248. Board Game Geek Guild 2248. And you can find us on Stitcher Radio, iTunes, Facebook, Berkey and Badger, Twitter, Berkey and Badger. And you can also find us on Badger's website, Board Games Everybody Should, or BoardGameTheater.com. Yeah. He's, he's gone silent. Oh, God. Pushed the wrong button. <laughs> 
I have a goal that you'd push the right buttons. Okay, that's my goal to push the right buttons. It might be easier when it's all on the same screen uh, when we upgrade. We're still we're still working it out, right? We're still working it out. Hey, also super great thanks to uh, our sponsor, Arcane Wonders, has been with us for several years. Uh, mm. We're just so grateful for Arcane Wonders support. Really helps us with our podcasting fees and all of the things like this new steam yard, you know, costs money to run. And so it's really, really great that they help us with that. But right from the very beginning, I've loved Arcane Wonders. I've loved their company philosophy, the type of games they produce. And they are the home of the Dice Tower Essential Games. So many fantastic games, you know, Sheriff of Nottingham and Onitama and Spoils of War. Um, you've, you've got architecture now and dragon scales and coming up foundations of Rome, uh, critical mass. I mean, Royals, uh, there's just some fantastic games in, in there. Uh, and of course, mage wars. So love arcane wonders, check them out at arcanewonders.com. Yeah. Thank you everyone for watching. I think he's waiting for me to do this. Thanks, everyone, for watching the Berkey and Badger Board Game Show. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back next time with some more babbling and more Berkey. Is that true? Play it. Play it. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Play it. <laughs> there. Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> We're so glad we had this time together. And now it's time to go. It won't be long until we have another show. So keep us in mind. Get online. Berkey and Badger will be back in, in no time. Woohoo! Another show in the books, baby. <laughs> <laughs>